Every single one of us has a phone number, but most of us never stop to think about it. To us, it's just a bunch of digits we rattle off when someone asks, or type into forms when we sign up for something. But here's the question, why that number? Why do phone numbers look the way they do? And who actually decides how they're given out? This everyday thing that seems so random is actually the result of a highly organized system that stretches across the entire globe. So today we're going to uncover the story behind a question you've probably never asked out loud. How are telephone numbers assigned? That's what we'll be exploring right here on History of Simple Things. Let's rewind back to the very beginning. When Alexander Graham Bell and his team invented the telephone in the late 1800s, there weren't any numbers at all. If you wanted to call someone, you literally picked up your phone and told an operator who you wanted to reach. Operators, usually women because the job required a calm voice and multitasking skills, would manually connect your line by plugging wires into a giant switchboard. You might say, connect me to Dr. Watson, and the operator would know which line that was. This worked fine at first, when there were only a handful of people with telephones in any given town. But as more and more people got telephones, the operator system became impossible to manage. Imagine living in New York City and telling the operator you want to call John. Which John? Out of thousands? That chaos is what gave rise to telephone numbers. The first telephone numbers were introduced in the late 19th century. Each customer was assigned a unique number, so instead of asking for someone by name, you asked for their number. At first, these weren't always purely numeric. Some cities used letters combined with numbers. This is where those old movie lines like Pennsylvania 6, 5000 come from. The letters corresponded to the exchange or the neighborhood switchboard, and the numbers identified the specific line within it. Eventually, numbers became fully numeric because letters created confusion and inconsistencies. This was also the beginning of something really important, standardization. For the system to work on a larger scale, everyone had to follow the same rules. So who's actually in charge of assigning telephone numbers? That depends on where you are in the world. Globally, the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, sets the framework. The ITU is a United Nations agency that coordinates things like country codes and ensures that every nation follows the same basic guidelines. For example, they're the reason why the United States and Canada share the country code plus one, while the UK has plus 44 and Japan has plus 81. Within each country, a national regulatory body takes charge. In the U.S., for example, the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, oversees the system, while in Canada, it's the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, CRTC. In the Philippines, it's the National Telecommunications Commission, NTC. These organizations decide how numbers get distributed to phone companies, and then the phone companies assign them to you and me. Okay, let's break down the anatomy of a phone number. Take a US number as an example. 212-555-1234. The first part, 212, is the area code. This tells the system which region the call should go to. Back in the day, area codes were tied strictly to geography. Today, with mobile phones, it's a little fuzzier. You can move to California and keep your New York area code. The next three digits, 555, are the exchange code. This identifies a specific central office within the area. The last four digits, 1234, 
are the line number. That's your unique identifier within that exchange. When you combine all three, you get a unique number that no one else in your region can have. Multiply this by thousands of area codes and exchanges, and you have millions of possible phone numbers. Now let's zoom out a bit. Why do we even need country codes like plus 44 for the UK or plus 63 for the Philippines? It's simple. Without them, international calls would be chaos. Imagine trying to dial a number in Paris without a country code. How would the system know that 01 at the beginning of the number refers to Paris and not New York? Country codes are like postal zip codes, but on a global scale. They tell the network which country the call should be routed to before drilling down to the area code and line number. Let's say you sign up for a new phone plan. How does your carrier decide which number you get? Carriers receive blocks of numbers from the national regulator. Think of it like getting a giant box of tickets. Each block belongs to a specific area code and exchange. When you sign up, the carrier pulls the next available number from their block and assigns it to your account. Some carriers also let you request a vanity number. That's when your number spells out something like 1-800-FLOWERS. Businesses love these because they're easy to remember. You might be wondering, if your number is tied to your carrier, why can you keep it when you switch companies? That's thanks to something called number portability. In most countries, regulators require carriers to let you transfer your number to a new provider if you want. It's your number, not theirs. Without this rule, carriers could lock you in by forcing you to change numbers every time you switched. So, next time you give someone your number or type it into a form, remember, it's not random. It's the result of decades of planning, regulation, and coordination across the globe. From operators plugging in wires to international agreements on country codes, every digit in your phone number has a purpose. And now you know the fascinating story of how telephone numbers are assigned. Thank you for watching. If you have suggestions for our next video, feel free to share them in the comments below. We'll be sure to give you an acknowledgement for your contribution. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our other bingeable channels. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history of simple things. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more stories woven through the smallest details.